Welcome to the House of Hypertrophy. The deltoids, consisting of the front, side and rear heads, are a key muscle group for unlocking an all-round impressive physique. The rear delts are particularly an unsung gem, as this head only boosts the 3D look of the muscle, especially when viewed from the side. But how can we most effectively train this muscle? How good are exercises like pull-ups and rows? And what exercises effectively isolate this muscle? Amidst all the sea of information on the internet, it can be easy to drown in confusion. But today we're going to be leveraging the current scientific literature as best as we can to infer how we can maximize radial hypertrophy. Let us plunge in. We'll be analysing a bunch of compound exercises. You may not necessarily train a lot of these variations about to be mentioned, and that is perfectly fine. After all, many people's goal is to predominantly target muscles other than the rear delts with compound exercises. We'll circle back to this point soon. Horizontal pulls, such as bent over rows, cable rows, inverted rows, and dumbbell rows are one broad category of compound exercises that are frequently included in many people's training program. There are different ways you can perform these horizontal pulls, and not all of them equally challenge the rear delts. All horizontal pulls involve elbow flexion, so we'll train the elbow flexors. But if you're performing horizontal pulls with a grip closer to being narrower, as done with close grip bent over rows, seated rows, inverted rows, and most dumbbell row variations, you're predominantly performing shoulder extension. How effective is this for the rear delts? Alongside the rear delts, the teres minor, teres major and lats are the main muscles that can pull on the upper arm bone to produce shoulder extension. But which of these muscles experiences the best stimulus? As detailed in this 2019 review study out of Australia, the teres major appears to have the largest leverage throughout shoulder extension. Note, each line is a different study. So here we can see two studies indicate the teres major have great leverage throughout shoulder extension. Before looking at the leverage for the other muscles, what on earth is leverage? Leverage refers to the muscle's moment arm. Here's the biceps and its line of force. We know it acts on the elbow joints. Between the elbow joint and the line of force, if we draw a perpendicular line, the distance of this line is the biceps moment arm. Fundamentally, a longer moment arm means a muscle has greater leverage and ability to generate movement. Think of a heavy door. Consider the moment arm as the distance between where you push the door and its hinges. If you push the door close to its hinges, it's challenging to open the door because the moment arm is small. But if you push the door further from its hinges, it's much easier to open the door because the moment arm is longer. So muscles that have a longer moment arm in any exercise are the ones that for the most part, have the greatest potential to generate movement. And various pieces of scientific research suggest leverage may be one of the more critical factors in how the central nervous system decides what muscles to activate the most during a movement. Returning to our analysis, the latissimus dorsi appears to have strong leverage for shoulder extension based on one study. But another study actually finds much lower leverage. Upon analysing this study closer, they actually separated the lats into an upper, middle and lower region, and they established the upper region tended to have the best leverage for shoulder extension compared to the two other regions. Plotting this upper lat region leverage into our graph, it's still apparent the two studies got quite divergent findings. It's not clear why this is, but this is a good time to mention that this research looking at leverage isn't flawless. Measuring the moment arm lengths of muscles isn't simple, precision is required, and researchers use varying methods. It's also worth mentioning that with the lats, they wrap around the posterior chest wall, and neither of the two studies assessing the lats leverage accounted for this, which means the estimated leverages are not going to be pinpoint accurate. But besides these points, it's also critical to understand people are not anatomically identical, and muscles leverage can vary between people. Even with these limitations in mind, this leverage literature still provides a quantifiable insight into the potential contribution of muscles to a movement. Going back to our analysis, three studies indicate the rear delts possess fairly good leverage. As for the teres minor, numerous studies indicate this tends to have lower leverage throughout shoulder extension. So what does all this information mean for horizontal pulls? 
Remember, horizontal pulls also tend to involve scat pillar retraction, so the traps and rhomboids will also get involved. Moreover, the lats could contribute to scapular attraction to some degree, since it's been identified the majority of people may have some link between their lats and scapula. Even so, I would sum up this data as suggesting that although the teres major and possibly lats may see the bulk of the stimulus, the rear delts will likely still be respectably targeted, so this movement should do well to contribute to rear delt development. However, if you perform your horizontal pulls with an even wider grip, such as done during wide grip barbell rows, seated rows, inverted rows, and dumbbell rows performed like this, they are likely going to be even more effective for the rear delts. Why? As you transition from a narrower to wider grip with horizontal pulls, you progress to performing shoulder horizontal extension. As found in this classic analysis, the rear delts tend to be the muscle with the greatest leverage for shoulder horizontal extension, with the infraspinatus and supraspinatus being close behind. The teres major and lats have a whole lot lower leverage. Further pointing towards this, we have fine wire electrode data establishing the rear delts experience slightly higher activity during shoulder horizontal extension motions compared to shoulder extension and rowing motions. And other fine wire electrode analyses also find relatively high recordings from the rear delts during shoulder horizontal extension. Now, fine wire electromyography involves inserting a fine wire needle into a muscle to record its electrical activity, and this method overcomes a few limitations associated with surface electromyography, which is where surface electrodes on the skin above a muscle are used to record electrical activity. It is worth understanding this point in a little more detail, since we will be referencing some surface electromyographic studies a little later. Fine wire electrodes minimize the potential of surrounding muscles to confound and interfere with our recordings, and during movement the fine wire electrodes are able to follow the muscle tissue as it moves. With surface electromyography, this doesn't really happen. Now, this isn't to say fine wire electrode research is perfect, there are still shortcomings. In one of the aforementioned studies, they didn't seem to equate relative loading between the exercises. Nonetheless, the totality of this leverage research and this fine wire electrode data leads me to believe that wider grip horizontal pulls rank above closer grip horizontal pulls for redelts. Let us now transition our discussion to vertical pulls before we begin to provide advice about how you may train long term for optimizing rear delt hypertrophy. <music> vertical pulls, such as pull ups and lat pull downs, are another common category of compound exercises that people heavily use in their training program. There are different ways you can perform vertical pulls, and not all of them are likely equally effective for targeting the rear delts. Like horizontal pulls, vertical pulls involve elbow flexion, so we'll train the elbow flexors. But if you're performing vertical pulls with a grip closer to being narrower, such as close grip pull ups and lat pull downs, you're predominantly performing shoulder extension. We've already established the leverage various muscles have for shoulder extension when dissecting close grip horizontal pulls, so you're actually performing a similar motion at the shoulder during closer grip vertical pulls and closer grip horizontal pulls. The main difference being vertical pulls enable a greater overall range of motion, approximately between 180 to 0 degrees, whereas the horizontal pulls tend to involve shoulder extension between 75 to minus degrees. That is, you can achieve shoulder hyperextension with horizontal pulls. We'll circle back to this point soon. Now, the leverage data does not go beyond 120 degrees, and we know vertical pulls involve shoulder angles beyond this range, but this is not a major problem, because both closer grip vertical and horizontal pull variations tend to be the hardest and thus maximally challenge the muscles below 120 degrees, and we know the rear delts have solid leverage here. Motion at the scapula will occur during vertical pulls, typically scapular depression and or downward rotation, so other muscles will be recruited. Interestingly, recall we previously noted there's data implying the majority of individuals have some link between the lats and the scapula, so the lats involvement during vertical pulls may further be enhanced through assisting with depression and downward rotation. Nonetheless, as with closer grip horizontal pulls, I would say closer grip vertical pulls respectively target the rear delts. What if you perform vertical pulls with a wider grip? As you progress from a narrower to wider grip, such as wider grip pull-ups and pull-downs, you predominantly transition to performing shoulder adduction. The teres major, lats, 
and subscapularis are the main muscles that have the capacity to pull on the upper arm bone to execute shoulder adduction. Returning to the 2019 review study out of Australia, they also detailed what the current scientific research says about the leverage these various muscles have throughout shoulder adduction. Two studies indicate the lats possess large leverage, and the same two studies also indicate the teres major possess large leverage. A few studies indicate the subscapularis has relatively smaller leverage. Most studies suggest the rear delts have minimal to no leverage for shoulder adduction throughout the range of motion. But this doesn't mean the rear delts aren't involved whatsoever with wider grip vertical pulls. In reality, most people don't perform super wide grip vertical pulls that is purely shoulder adduction. Rather, it tends to be a somewhat wide grip that uses a mixture of shoulder adduction and shoulder extension. In technical terms, you might consider this adduction in the scapular plane. On screen shows the results of a few studies that have analyzed the leverage of the rear delt overall for scapular plane adduction. Although some of them indicate very small leverage, others do find fairly decent leverage. But overall, I would say wider grip vertical pulls are going to rank below closer grip vertical pulls for targeting the rear delts. Indeed, a 2002 surface electromyography analysis out of the USA supports this. They found closer grip lap pulldowns evoked higher rear delt activity compared to wider grip lap pulldowns. As alluded to earlier, surface electromyography SEMG has multiple limitations. In fact, if you've followed the House of Hypertrophy for a while, you'll know I'm highly critical of it. There are examples where surface electromyography research fails to predict actual muscle hypertrophy results. Yet, this doesn't necessarily mean all SEMG research is erroneous. There are some cases where it does predict muscle hypertrophy. For example, previous SEMG research indicates when training the calves, placing the feet outwards enhanced medial gastrocnemius activity, while placing the feet inwards enhanced lat Actual gastrocnemius activity. Indeed, research measuring actual muscle hypertrophy finds calf presses with the feet outwards preferentially grew the medial gastrocnemius, while performing them with the feet inwards preferentially grew the lateral gastrocnemius. Thus, the question is are the findings of the present surface electromyography analysis correct? Given the leverage research we've overviewed, I'm inclined to believe it is probably closer to being correct. So here's the overall rankings of the compound exercises we've analyzed for rear delt development. Some of you may be questioning why I placed closer grip horizontal pulls above closer grip vertical pulls, despite the fact that both involve shoulder extension. Recall I mentioned you can achieve shoulder hyperextension with horizontal pulls, something not typically attained with narrower grip vertical pulls. This shoulder hyperextension likely further biases the rear delts, hence why I opted to rank closer grip horizontal pulls above closer grip vertical pulls. Some of you might push back against this and suggest since closer grip vertical pulls involve a greater overall range of motion, they should be ranked above closer grip horizontal pulls. I certainly understand where this point of view is coming from. But as we'll see a little later on, a greater range of motion simply doesn't seem to be associated with more muscle hypertrophy. Before providing further information and then advice about how you may train long term for optimizing rear delt hypertrophy, some of you may be wondering about performing vertical pulls with a supinated grip, like done in chin ups and supinated grip lat pulldowns. Whenever you're using a supinated grip on vertical pulls, you're predominantly performing shoulder extension, like you do with closer grip vertical and horizontal pulls. However, it's not crystal clear if the supinated grip does anything to reduce involvement of the shoulder extensors, such as the rear delts. Intriguingly, the aforementioned 2002 SEMG analysis out of the USA found supinated grip lap pulldowns evoked lower rear delt activity compared to closer grip lap pulldowns. In fact, the supinated grip lap pulldowns rear delt activity was similar to that obtained in wider grip lap pulldowns. Again, we need to view these surface electromyography studies through a lens of caution. The truth is I don't know if these findings are valid. One could speculate that supinated grips likely heavily involves the biceps, and this heavy biceps involvement lowers the activity of the shoulder extensors such as the rear delts. I think this is certainly a valid speculation. Thus, supinated vertical pulls may either be alongside wider grip vertical pulls if the surface electromyography findings reflect the truth, or above the wider grip vertical pulls if they don't. As alluded to near the start of the video, you're most likely not training all of these variations in your program, but if a few of these compound exercises are already in your program, is that all you need for developing the rear delts in the long term? 
If you're a recreational lifter who isn't necessarily overly worried about truly maximizing radial hypertrophy, rather you're just after notable improvements, training with some of these vertical and horizontal pulls may be sufficient. Even if you're not necessarily training the one ranked as the best, we still know that other ones will contribute to rear delt development. Here's what you could do. Simply train with whatever horizontal and vertical pulling exercises you like. After some months, or even a year, evaluate your rear delt progress. If you're not satisfied with your rear delt development, then at this point, Point, it's going to be a good idea to add in some isolated rear delt exercises to your training. If you're somebody with the intention of doing everything in your power to maximize rear delt hypertrophy, then I believe it makes sense to also add some isolated rear delt exercises on top of whatever vertical and horizontal pulls you may be performing in your training program. Fundamentally, this seems to be a fine strategy for enhancing a muscle's development. For example, a recent study by Cassiano speaks to this with the glute max. 33 previously untrained women trained three times per week for 10 weeks. One group purely trained the leg press and stiff legged deadlift, each with these variables. Another group also trained the leg press and stiff legged deadlift, but they added a hip thrust. Strictly speaking, the hip thrust isn't actually an isolation exercise, but as seen previously at the House of Hypertrophy, we know this movement predominantly just grows the glute max. This second group, due to the addition of the hip thrust, ended up performing more total sets. It was ultimately found glute max growth was superior for this second group. Overall, since isolation exercises are generally a lot less taxing and fatiguing, I think they're just a great way to train a muscle more while attempting to keep recovery in check. Before detailing what may be some of the best rear delt isolation exercises, in my attempt to make this video as in-depth as possible, I do want to mention two SEMG studies which find that reverse machine flies, an isolation rear delt exercise, evoked higher rear delt activity compared to seated rows. These findings are quite interesting because the seated rows were performed in a way that meant shoulder horizontal extension was occurring, which is the same movement occurring at the shoulder in machine reverse flies. Despite this, the findings indicate higher rear delt activity from the machine reverse flies, which at face value suggests they may provide a larger stimulus. On the one hand, many people may not be surprised with these findings, but on the other hand, I do certainly see why these results may be somewhat surprising to others, because as just mentioned, both of them fundamentally involve the same movement at the shoulder joint, so why would Riddell involvement be different? Once again, I can't overstate that we must view these SEMG studies through the lens of caution, but if these findings reflect the truth, one could speculate that the fact seated rows involve motion at the elbow, and perhaps the possibility some subjects attracted and engaged their muscles around the scapula as plausible reasons behind the findings. Nevertheless, machine reverse flies was the rear delt isolation exercise used in these two SEMG studies, but what are the most effective exercises for isolating the rear delts? As per the leverage and fine wire electrode research, we know the rear delts are highly involved in shoulder horizontal extension. And besides machine reverse flies, dumbbell and cable reverse flies also involve this motion. Face pulls although technically a compound exercise, also involve this motion when performed in this way. Finally, dumbbell power raises involve the movement. Are any of these potentially more effective for building the red outs? At the time of recording, this is how I would rank them. I hypothesize cable reverse flies and dumbbell power raises are two of the best rear delt builders, with face pulls and machine reverse flies ranked behind them, and then finally dumbbell reverse flies. Now, I don't believe this is a flawless ranking, and I know not everyone will necessarily agree with it, but allow me to explain my thought process behind it. With dumbbell reverse flies, it's important to note just because they are ranked last, it does not mean they are tragic for growing the rear delts. I think they will do a good job. The limitation with them, however, is that they are only most challenging at that shortened muscle position, at the final end range of motion. Machine reverse flies are a step up from this as they do a better job at providing resistance throughout the range of motion. I've also placed face pulls at the same level, and this one may be a little more controversial. Although face pulls are more challenging at the shortened position, in addition to involving shoulder horizontal extension, they also involve external rotation. And something I've yet to mention in this video is the rear delts are involved in external rotation. Thus, perhaps the combination of these movements could be somewhat beneficial. At the top of the rankings, we have cable reverse flies and dumbbell power raises. These involve shoulder horizontal extension, but both of these movements involve the attainment of a great stretch of the rear delts and are highly challenging around that lengthened muscle position. 
If you've followed the House of Hypertrophy for a while, you'll know there's emerging research indicating that training muscles at more lengthened positions seems to build more muscle. This study from Japan compared seated leg curls to lying leg curls. Seated leg curls stretch out the hamstrings better, and they more effectively grew the hamstrings. Another study by the same authors compared triceps overhead extensions to pushdowns, and overhead extensions better stretch out the long triceps head. They more effectively grew the overall triceps. Moreover, emerging data indicates a partial range of motion at that long muscle length may be superior to using a full range of motion. This study by Pedrosa involves comparing a partial range of motion leg extension at the initial position, where the quads are at a longer length, to a full range of motion. Vastus lateralis and rectus femoris hypertrophy tended to be overall better with a partial range of motion at the initial position. Another study by Cassiano compared performing this calf exercise with a partial range of motion at the stretched position to using a full range of motion. Medial and lateral gastrocnemius hypertrophy favored using the partial range of motion at the stretched position. Finally, a recent abstract from Japan indicates with a multi-hit machine, using a partial range of motion at a longer length produced overall better muscle hypertrophy compared to using a full range of motion. Now, this particular study has only been presented as an abstract at a conference, but I'm presuming it will be officially published soon. I think more research is needed to examine if a partial range of motion at long muscle lengths always builds muscle more effectively than using a full range of motion in all circumstances. But at least this literature further points towards that lengthened muscle position being valuable for evoking muscle growth. And this combined overall literature surrounding muscle length leads me to hypothesize cable reverse flies and dumbbell power raises could be the two better rear delt builders. Having said all of this, some people have speculated the rear delt should not grow more with exercises attaining a stretch. Why? They believe so due to research looking at the length tension relationship of the rear delt sarcomeres. However, as I've previously detailed in an article, I believe this literature has a range of limitations that means it cannot be sincerely used to decipher if a particular muscle will benefit from exercise attaining a stretch or not. Thus, in the absence of other research, these rankings reflect my current speculations. If any new research comes along that may influence my thinking into a different direction, I'll be sure to update you all. If you're curious about further ideas for creating an effective muscle building program, our high quality partner Alpha Progression can help. It contains an extremely flexible custom workout generator that can tailor a program to your needs. You determine how often and how long you want to train for, and whether you want to focus on certain muscles. You can also specify what equipment is available to you. There are well over a quadrillion input combinations on which custom workouts are generated. A great thing is the training philosophy in the app is based on meta-analyses and literature reviews. There are also aesthetic graphs that can track virtually everything, like your strength progression, number of workouts, body weight, and even set numbers per week and the circumference of body regions. The link in the comments and description gives you a free two-week trial of all the app's features. And if you like the app and go beyond, the link gives you 20% off a subscription. Rest assured the app is of the highest standard. We don't just partner with anyone at the house of hypertrophy. As a fun fact, although we typically consider the deltoid to consist of three segments, the front, side and rear segments, there is research suggesting the deltoids actually consist of seven segments. Fascinatingly, texts dating back from as early as 1734 have documented this, and the segments are visible in lean individuals. Although there's no unanimous agreement, functional data would suggest the first segment is the front head, the second two segments the side head, and the final four segments the rear head. It's not currently clear if certain exercises may preferentially grow different segments of the rear head. But we can be confident that all the exercises described as being respectable or better for developing the rear head would effectively train all four segments. Nonetheless, in summary, both vertical and horizontal pulling exercises can effectively train the rear delts. Based on the available evidence, this is how I would broadly rank their effectiveness. If you're training some of these, I do believe you will see great rear delt development in the long term. If you're simply a recreational lifter who's not overly concerned about maximizing everything, 
then I would say isolated rear delt exercises are probably not essential. Although, I will say that if after a few months or a year of training your choice of horizontal and vertical pulling exercises, if you are not satisfied with your rear delt development, then at this point it's going to be worth adding in isolated rear delt training. Likewise, if you're someone who is trying to do everything in your power to maximize rear delt hypertrophy, adding isolated rear delt training to whatever compound exercises you're training is probably going to be required. Based on the available evidence, this is how I would rank isolation rear delt exercises. Feel free to consider checking out our guide to side delt hypertrophy.